I think it's very important when you're seeing someone who had a mild traumatic brain injury or a concussion injury not to give them the impression that nothing significant happened to them. Many times what happens is when someone has a mild traumatic brain injury, no one explains to them what's going to happen. And so when they start to notice problems with thinking, problems with memory, or that they feel depressed or that they feel more tired, they don't understand the reason for it. And that then causes stress, which prolongs their recovery and exacerbates all the difficulties that they may have. They're not crazy. They're not psychiatric. They're not um, all kinds of other things that people may lay on them. They've had a brain injury. And since people don't understand brain injury, they're going to wonder what's happening to them. And families are not going to understand it, and the boss and employer is not going to understand it, and they need some of that emotional support early. So the accurate diagnosis regarding the fact they've had a mild brain injury early on is really crucial if you want to get treatment started, particularly during this early window which, when you can be effective. And we found in our practice that once people understand what's going on, this goes a long way towards reducing some of those comorbid disorders. Just the fact that the physician can say, yes, I've seen this before, I know what this is, people feel such relief from that. So you want to do a lot of reassurance for people with brain injuries because they don't know what this is going to be like. It's important to use the term brain injury rather than head trauma. Head trauma is misleading. It sounds like a, a scalp wound. And brain damage is pejorative and is going to scare the daylights out of everybody. So the term we tend to use is brain injury. And we don't refer to the person as brain injured because that implies that the most important and only thing to know about them is their brain injury. The, the better term that people tend to use is a person with a brain injury, meaning they're still a person, they're still a human being, and they have this thing that has happened, but it's not the only thing about them. And I often will tell them that, that this is one thing that we're going to have to factor in like any other medical condition. I also will reassure them they're going, to need, they're going to be scared. I provide lots of reassurance that there can be therapy that can be done to help cognitive changes. I do tell folks that it, it's not as if your cognitive faculties are gone, never to return. Um, they're just not as efficient for a while, particularly with people who were higher functioning at the onset of injury, prior to injury, very bright people. Their brain has always been extremely reliable for them. You know, they clip along, everything's very easy for them. A mild injury is very noticeable for those individuals and can be extremely frustrating. So really like to especially tell people who use their brain all day, rely on their brain, very high functioning, that, that these slight cognitive setbacks can be frustrating. But they're very common. Patients can be better on some days and worse on others. Overall, the most important aspect after making the diagnosis is reassuring the patient, letting the patient understand what, that he has suffered a traumatic brain injury and that he may be prone to having these cognitive, emotional, and behavioral changes that they may come and go, and that that in and of itself is normal. Families are an important part of coping and dealing with someone with a brain injury. And families need education also. It's important for families to understand that there are not just cognitive changes, but emotional changes, personality changes, uh, sometimes motor physical control from the brain to the body changes. And the family needs a lot of education about that. I think it's also important that we provide support to the families. Everybody wants to focus on the identified patient, the person with a brain injury, and forgets how devastating this may be for the family. Role changes may take place. A spouse may have to go to work where the spouse didn't work before, or uh, may have to take on financial management for the family where they didn't do that before. There may be more burden placed on a spouse for child rearing than there was before. There may be more burden placed on the family members for transportation if the person cannot drive. All this tends to fall on the family. One of the things that happens with a chronic injury like a brain injury is the support system for the family starts dropping out because we all are used to helping out in the short run. And as time goes on, other people get on with their lives. So the burden falls on the spouse and the family to help cover the deficits of the person with the brain injury. And no one individual, a spouse, child, um, a small family, can handle this alone. They need a team of people. And telling the family that they're going to need the team of people or giving them permission to say, I can't keep this up, I need help. Brain injury is not a sprint, it's a marathon. So you have to pace yourself. The 
person has to pace themselves and the family has to pace themselves. And as providers, we need to tell them this and help them do that. I would recommend having available pamphlets and handouts about brain injury, and I would refer everybody who you suspect has a brain injury to the Brain Injury Association because they will provide a lot of information and a lot of support. Medical providers will want to inform family members and even employers that the patient's behavioral, emotional, personality, or cognitive changes are not intentional, that physical and or mental fatigue does not mean that the patient is lazy or malingering. They should be informed that the patient's condition is likely to improve over time, to be supportive and patient. They should also be instructed to seek immediate medical attention for the patient if a rapid decline is noted. Patients may also benefit from non-clinical interventions, including techniques to manage stress, such as Tai Chi, meditation, deep breathing, avoiding overstimulation, adjusting pace, and not pushing through fatigue. Patients should be counseled to get more sleep and rest, avoid high-risk activities, use seat belts, helmets, and other safety measures, exercise, avoid alcohol, nicotine, and other chemicals, limit caffeine consumption, and eat a balanced and healthy diet. An important part, especially in the very early phases of, re of uh, recovering from a, a mild traumatic brain injury, has to do with, with lifestyle and just taking good care of yourself. So reducing stress, adequate sleep, good no nutrition, uh, regular exercise, all the aerobic exercise seems to be particularly beneficial. And again, this doesn't have to be an aerobics class. A, a brisk walk around the block is better than nothing. And this is the kind of thing we tell our patients. There are growth factors that are um, um, produced when a person exercise, exercises that are supposed to um, promote neurogenesis, meaning regeneration um, or growth of new neurons in the brain. So there are many reasons why a person should exercise, whether you have a brain injury or you don't. We're going by some evidence and clinical experience and what we think is logical and makes sense at the moment. But we need to realize that as we gain further evidence and do more sophisticated research, uh, we'll find out more and hopefully be able to better uh, treat our patients.